but you know it wasn't just that it was it was everything it was everything the flight yeah. attendants all look sick beaten down and they, sick and... they were crabby they were yeah. fighting with each other arguing yeah. loudly not caring who else heard yeah in the plane um there was a lot of drama going on behind the scenes and then there was like outright lying by the carrier and this was delta and american airlines that i flew on Delta's really, really run down. Yeah, the, the plane with all the duct tape on the wing, they said at the beginning we were going to be delayed because of a maintenance issue. They had to fix a tray table in the aircraft. And so about five minutes later, a guy comes in with a roll of duct tape and fixes the tray table. And then we sat there another 45 minutes while there were these loud bangs going on underneath the plane. And <laughs> I was just like, oh, my God. That was the hydraulics. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, the hammer. But I mean, it was it was quite an experience having that kind of like knowledge and perspective. And I know that there's a lot of issues with you know the maintenance and costs and the airlines losing money and it's they're skimping everywhere. And I mean, everywhere. the planes are unbelievably dirty inside. You know, the windows are so dirty, it's it's like a Petri dish when you look at it. And, um, you know, I mean, that was my, my recent experience and one that I hope I don't have to repeat anytime soon. And I need to go back to Salt Lake City around Thanksgiving, and I think I'm probably going to drive from drive, Michigan. Take a train. Even, yeah, take a train. Take a train. <laughs> They're they're decaying from inside the airline. They are. Uh, the thing I found more interesting was the description of that engine, the the blow up and the flame out. Yeah. Jet engines are made up of vanes. They look like they might be propellers, and in a way they are, but in another way they aren't. What happens is, is they're made to spin rapidly in order to induce air to be made to spin over them more rapidly. So at a certain point, you build enough pressure so that you can light a big fire and you can have the escaping, the expanding gas from that go out the back of the jet engine. That's what it's all about. So those vanes that are in there spinning at these incredible mm -hmm. speeds they have to be kept very cool. So they've got micro holes drilled in them. They're made to be self-cooling to pass atmosphere. So now we're going through all of this radiation, and it's being very, very technically, carefully channeled in and through these veins, keeping them cool. And Vigner's happening very rapidly, and every now and then a vein breaks off. When a vein breaks off, this rare metal starts burning. As it's being blown out the back in that expanding gas, that's what she saw, and the rest of it was the flame out and the engine coming down. There was another um, electrical issue that we didn't cover, and that's the batteries exploding in planes on the ground. I haven't heard of them exploding in the air, but they have exploded on the ground. And that's reminiscent of... A problem, I believe it was Toyota had a few years ago when they had to recall lithium batteries. These batteries that are exploding on the ground in airplanes are also lithium batteries. And what happens is the Wigner effects change or alter the gel that is in the battery and cause it to explode. That is definitely. Wigner effects, and it could probably happen to um, other types of batteries. I'm not familiar enough with batteries, but we hear of cell phones exploding and, and other batteries exploding. Something is causing this. It doesn't just happen. In, in terms of the, the static on airliners, and, and by the way, those battery meltdowns, that you're referring to that happened on at least two or three occasions on Japan to, to Hawaii flights 
That's yeah. right. And I believe it might have even been the same plane. They'd had a, an issue with the same plane and a battery a, a few months before that. Uh huh. But with the the static on airliners too, and trying to visualize what's actually happening, the way that it was explained to me is that you have this like transferring of electrons. Yeah. That's aided by friction, and when a plane flies through air, there's friction. Kind of like when you rub a balloon against your hair and that makes your hair stick to the balloon. That same effect occurs on an aircraft because of the friction against the plane as it moves through the air. And then, because air is an insulator for electricity, when the plane is flying, this static charge on the airplane's skin actually builds up on the aircraft at a high altitude. It begins, it, it tends to become much larger because the air is acting as an insulator and it's preventing the excess electrons from returning back to the air. So the way that I'm, I'm picturing this with what I know about, you know, aggregation kinetics and what we've been learning or what I've been learning about fallout for the last three and a half years, that it's almost like these planes are scavenging the radi radioactive particles out of the air. And if that is happening, what could pilots look for, what would be the most obvious signs in the aircraft skin? Are there any signs in the electronics before, you know, a, a catastrophic power loss occurs? Um, you know, what could aviation mechanics actually look for? Well, they should first uh, get a Geiger counter and do a survey on the surface of the, of the plane. What happens with radioactive particles is when they're in air masses, um, they are nucleating agents for moisture. In other words, the moisture condenses and collects around that charged, highly charged particle or snowflake. And when enough water has collected on that particle, it, uh, it forms fog or rain or uh, snowflakes have very sharp edges and, and sharp tips and uh, they're very geometric. And along those edges and the tips, they're highly, highly charged. So snow actually cleans out 95% of the radiation in the atmosphere that it passes through. So these planes that are flying through snowstorms or they're iced up on the ground or, um, or they they do they're flying through a lot of rain clouds and stuff. They're going to attract radioactive particles, and when a particle, highly charged radioactive particle, has moisture on the surface, whatever it lands on, it sticks to. It's called Van der Waals forces. And you can never clean that particle off. You cannot uh, decontaminate. They tried to decontaminate ships that the Navy put out in the lagoons when they did the bomb test. They had to throw those ships away, like 100 ships, including an aircraft carrier, at Bikini Atoll because they couldn't decontaminate it. And when you sandblast it, you drive the radiation into the metal even more. So there's no way to decontaminate. Um, when fighter jets are flying through the air column, they're flying at very high speeds, so they are being exposed to higher radiation levels than a plane, a commercial plane that's flying slower. Um, and so you would expect to see the Wigner effects acting on uh, military jets faster than on commercial planes. Now, as far as the part of your question about the crew being able to look somewhere in order to see a record of these things, it would be mostly a question of what is available to them, made available to them, because we're in the age of fly-by-wire, which is another thing where you've got multiple computers and they're actually controlling the attitude surfaces the ailerons, the rudders, uh, all of that on your aircraft. 
And what you're doing is you're inputting from your control harness yoke, uh, your wheel and your rudder pedals, however it is the plane's configured, to computers. And the computers are telling the plane what it is that the computers think you have on your mind as the pilot. Fly by wire. So all of this telemetry is stored. When these planes are up in the air, the commercial ones, Rolls-Royce is getting a report every 10 or 15 minutes via radio telemetry on the performance of their engine. This happens from the moment that the plane is powered up until the moment that that plane is powered down. That's right. The information is somewhere. The question is, can you get it? Well, the Geiger counter measures the actual radiation. In nuclear power plants, they X-ray or use some kind of intrusive technology to look at pipes in the nuclear power plant carrying the cooling water in and out of it. And um, where the pipes bend, they have a joint there, um, is where uh, there's more stress on the pipe and that's where a lot of the cracks and the fracturing occurs uh, in the metal. They have special instrumentation and technology to look for cracks and weaknesses in the metal. Uh, they've told me about it and that can be used on the commercial planes also. You can't really see <coughs> radiation when it's low level contamination. Yes, the non-destructive testing or NDT. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, a group of analysis techniques Right. that they can use in science and industry, and they use this with nuclear reactor parts and shrouds right. and pressure vessels, too, where they can assess the properties of the material or metal or component or system right. without actually causing damage. And one it's of them is like an ultrasound, um, magnetic yes. particle, liquid yes. penetrance, uh, radiographs. Right. Um, eddy, something called eddy current testing, right, and low coherence interferometry, mm, and they are they are exactly looking for the Wigner effect. That those are all technologies that would be used to assess the Wigner damage. They they commonly use this besides in the nuke industry. They use it in forensic engineering. Yeah, yep. and mechanical engineering, electrical right. engineering. So I mean, th this isn't, this is nothing new. In engineering, you have to know rates of entropy in order to know how big or how thick or how heavy to build something. That's right. Another really good point, Larry, that you brought up with the military planes mm -hmm. and the electrical charge that builds up on aircraft and how it's much greater with the military planes because of the... Um, Their flight parameters, the places they go, the speeds they go at. Yes, they actually have to have their windshields grounded prior to pilots getting out of the cockpit because of the massive amounts of voltage that can build up they even have. on short flights. And this happens as well on helicopters uh. because of the blade rotation. Yeah. Sure, they had helicopters that hang grounding straps right off of them, just like you used to see hanging off of cars in America in the 50s. All of these types of things happen. They, helicopters can actually generate 50,000 volts in half a second. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that's also why they ground hoist cables when they have to do rescues. Uh, or yep. else they'll shock the rescuer and the person in the basket. Ammonia. Cross touches. Sure. So, very interesting how all these things are tying together.